at three years old. Now, picture yourself being three years old and being told that you're going to go to Disneyland. You know, that place where all your favorite Disney characters are in and where all the magic of the fairy tales is in one place. That is what my mother told me when I was three years old. I was excited to go to Disneyland. But you see, our journey to Disneyland was not very common. Instead, it was at night, and we were with a group of strangers. There was a leader who would take us and walk us through the desert and would tell us, bend down, bend down, whenever a white van would pass by quickly. And we would all bend down and listen. And once that white van passed quickly, we got up and continued our journey through the desert. We ended up in front of this big yellow fence, and my mom told me, on the other side of the big yellow fence is Disneyland. So we climbed over it and we made it through the other side, crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. I wasn't afraid. After all, we were going to Disneyland. And it meant that finally the adults were playing with me and bending down and getting up and running around. It was all a game to me. For my mother, it was not a game. She understood that she was leaving everything she's known and everything behind to be reunited with my father. I remember her telling me that she would feel her knees weak and wobbly as she walked through the desert. There was a moment where the man and the people in the white van spotted us and began to chase us. We all began to run, run away from them. My mom was done. She couldn't run anymore. Her legs were too weak. She wanted to stop. But then she realized that my 11-year-old brother was all the way in front of the group, running. She couldn't leave him behind. So I don't know from where, but she took the little bit of force that was left in her and continued running. Eventually, they stopped chasing us, and we continued our journey through the desert. A year before our journey, my dad had decided to immigrate to the United States. He believed in the American dream. He believed in a country filled with richness and opportunities, and a life like the one portrayed in the Hollywood movies that you see, and in the American television shows. He wanted to go to the United States and work in hopes of saving enough money to be able to have our own business, because he was tired of the insecurity in our country. He was tired of the violence, of the lack of opportunities and resources, and of earning so little that he could barely make enough money for us. He took every job he could, from construction to cleaning, to working in a restaurant, to even cutting trees. One of his construction projects was in front of an elementary school. He would tell me that he remembers seeing the line of yellow buses coming to an elementary school that wasn't gated like the ones in Mexico where he grew up in, but it was an open school with a big green field and a playground, a playground just like the ones in the picture books that he had seen in the store. He fell in love with that elementary school, and he began to dream. He wanted my brother and I to attend that elementary school. So within that year, he kept working day and night and saved up enough money to be able to get his own apartment and be able to bring my mother, my brother, and I. At the end of the journey, we did not arrive to the Disneyland I expected. Instead, it was an empty apartment with only a cardboard box as a table. But to me, it was magical. There was so much space and finally, a place for us to call our own. Soon after our trip, my mother told me, Mariana, this is not Disneyland. OK, Mom, I got that. <laughs> Mariana, I need you to keep a really big secret for me. You cannot tell anyone ever of how you got here, because if you do, those people in the white vans will want to come and get us and take us back to Mexico. I didn't understand why, but I knew it wasn't a good thing, so I kept that secret. 
I'm sure many of you have had that nightmare at one point in your life when you were a kid of losing a parent or being separated from them at the store. Do you remember that fear and that anxiety that comes with that dream? Now imagine having that anxiety every day. I lived with that anxiety every time I got off the bus. Afraid that getting off the school bus, I would get home to an empty house because maybe the people in the white vans picked up my parents. I had that anxiety whenever someone would knock at a door because I was afraid that maybe it wasn't a friend knocking, maybe they finally found us. I was afraid of that whenever some stranger would approach us at the grocery store and accidentally bump into us because I thought, oh my, that's them. Can you imagine having that constant fear? But I was a kid. And yes, I knew that I had that anxiety, but I always thought, things will be fine. Things will eventually get solved, and we will finally be able to stay in our home, because why wouldn't we? I thought we were a pretty great family. We were a pretty normal family, just like the ones in my classmates. It had made absolutely no sense why we couldn't stay here. But as the time passed, I finally understood the complexity of our situation. In eighth grade, I got off the school bus and I saw my dad going around the neighborhood in his car. I found that odd and I went to him. I got in the car with him and I asked him what was going on. He said he wanted to make sure that there were no ICE agents around the neighborhood looking for us. And I thought, why? What happened? Then he kept looking straight as he drove and he told me, your brother has been detained by ICE. I felt numb. My 21-year-old brother, who was attending PCC at the time, was detained. We did not know where he was. We did not know when he would be deported or where he would be deported. When you're deported, they, they don't tell you what border crossing they'll drop you off at. They'll just drop you off at anyone with however you were detained, empty-handed. But what hurt the most was that I was afraid because I knew that I didn't know how long I would see my brother. And it hurt my parents, not only for their son, but because all those sacrifices I had made for my brother to have a better opportunity and to have a better future was not allowed for him. They have not seen my brother in nine years. He currently resides in Mexico and he can no longer continue his studies. He has to work and start from the same square that my parents were at 20 years ago. I am what people call a dreamer. I'm sure many of you have heard this term in the news as they talk about youth who were brought in as a kid to the United States. The term dreamer comes from the DREAM Act. The DREAM Act was a bill that was introduced in 2001 that would eventually allow people like me to stay in this country, work legally, and eventually, after many years, have the opportunity to apply for a green card and eventually citizenship if, of course, we fit all the requirements and pass background checks. The DREAM Act has not passed. It has been reintroduced many times and has always failed. The last time that it was presented, it was in 2011. It came the closest, but we failed by three short votes. After that, President Obama then presented an executive order called DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. DACA would allow people like me to be able to not fear deportation and be able to work here for two years, and they would have to renew it and, of course, enter in a lot of evidence to the government and tell them, hey, I'm here, come out of the shadows, and have to pass this rigorous background check. So I did that and I became a DACA recipient, along with 800,000 other undocumented kids like I. A month and a half ago, September 5th, 2017, at 8 a.m., Jeff Sessions made an announcement that the Trump administration had decided to repeal DACA. And just like that, more than 800,000 youth like me will no longer be able to work legally here and will be at risk of deportation when their permit expires. 
You see, we are at this moment, we are being used as a token for negotiation. The administration is using us to be able to negotiate. All right, we took this away from dreamers. But in order for us to be able to protect those dreamers, we want greater immigration enforcement, raids, and restricting more immigration laws. Because they say it is a priority for the security of our nation. Yet, less than 7% of undocumented immigrants have any form of record. This includes both misdemeanors and felonies. And many of those are actually violations related to migration, such as having a fecari to be able to work and provide for your family, or something called self-smuggling, which means since you brought yourself into this country, you therefore smuggled someone to the country. Or because you just drove without a license because you can't get a license anymore. Today, the dreamers are being highlighted because of their accomplishments. And yes, many youth, they grew up here. This is their home. And they have graduated school here, and they have gone off to college, and they become lawyers, and have had many accomplishments. And that is great. But unfortunately, they only highlight those stories. They do not highlight the stories of my parents, of my grandparents, of my aunts and uncles, and of the rest of the 11 million undocumented immigrants in this country. That minima minimalizes and devalues the hard work and the contributions that they are making. Immigrants contribute to this economy. Immigrants, undocumented immigrants, pay taxes, believe it or not, even though that's a big myth. We pay, we pay plenty of taxes. And we are part of this community. But unfortunately, they continue to be criminalized. And when negotiating this stricter immigration laws, they put us against our own families, or against our own undocumented community, and against the people who want to immigrate here, who are escaping the same things we escaped, but they are not allowing them to. I started the story saying that my parents, my mom told me we were gonna go to Disneyland. Eventually I did go to Disneyland when I was six, the real Disneyland. And I remember at night that we saw the castle lit up with the fireworks and the Disney song go off, and it was so magical. My dad was carrying me and I turned to him and I pointed at the castle and the fireworks. But when I saw him, I realized that he was crying. And I turned to my mother and she was crying too. It didn't make sense why they were crying. But now I understand that they were crying because for them, Disneyland represented so much more. It represented opportunity. It represented the possibility of bettering their lives and bettering the lives of the kids. My mom, as a child, used to clean houses with her mother in Mexico. And she remembers the families going to vacation to this famous Disneyland. It never crossed her head that she would ever have the possibility to ever go to Disneyland. My dad, he was an optimistic man. He's a dreamer. And for him, it represented that finally the dream of bettering his life and for his family was right in front of his eyes. When my dad saw that elementary school, he dreamt for my brother and I. But today, our future is still uncertain. The magical Disneyland he dreamed of has unfortunately lost some magic. But despite all that, they continue fighting, and they continue striving for that dream, because they still see magic in me and in this place. Their only crime was striving for a better future. They are the original dreamers. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. And now, I'm sure many of you have had dreams and have had to have sacrificed things and have to make sacrifices for your family. And sometimes there are always obstacles. They get in front of those dreams. So I would like to end with one question to you all. How much are you willing to sacrifice for your family and for your dreams?